ओम नास्ता धर्म में न बस सुनी चाहिए नहीं वो काम उपभोगे जब भाग्यम तद भवत भगवान पूर्व कर्मानुरूपम ये तत् प्रार्थ्यम मम बहुमतम जन्म जन्मांतरे अपि तत् पादम बरुओ जुगोगता निश्चला भक्ति रस्तु बोलो जाइ जून वच केयर फॉर सो कॉल मेरिटोरियस एक्ट्स नीदर फॉर वेल्थ नॉर फॉर एन्जॉयमेंट ऑफ द ऑब्जेक्ट्स ऑफ डिजायर लेट दैट व्हिच इज इन एविचेबल फॉल टू माय लाइफ अकॉर्डिंग टू माय प्रीवियस कर्म बट दिस इज माय चेरिश्ड डिजायर दैट आई शुड बी एंडाउड विद लव अनशेकन फॉर द लोटस फीट इन दिस लाइफ as well as in lives to come om shanti 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 peace 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 be to all this morning our subject is stories of vedanta monks part 19 as you know it is a series of talk based on the disciples of sri ramakrishna's disciples i met many of them and i collected their reminiscences from in my diaries i interviewed them with my tape recorders and i got some of their own personal diaries we learn many things from these monks everything is not in the books somebody asked shami shivanand swami could you tell us how ramakrishna taught you well i can tell you what ramakrishna told me but i cannot show you how he told me because his gesture his posture his expression his mode of teaching was something unique his teachings would penetrate inside us and he created such a such an example such an image that you will never forget that is the way sri ramakrishna taught us people have tell me a story tell the stories i shall take a story from the indian folklore or you may say that it is this the rites of the saints and the devotees of india there are two a couple named ranka and banka they are great devotees to krishna and in punjabpur in maharashtra there was a saint named namodeva So Namadeva saw these two devotees are extremely poor. They cut wood from the forest and sell in the city, and that is the way they make their living. So this saint prayed to Lord Krishna and said, "Lord, these people are such devotees, such devotees, and they have no money, very poor. Why don't you help them?" Krishna told him. they have so much renunciation even if i offer money they will not accept it they love me they do not love money what can i do i like to see why you you do don't you give some money to them all right tomorrow you will see so the, this couple are in the morning went to the forest to cut some woods firewood and ranka found some gold on the on the on the road so he was thinking but as my wife may be tempted to get them so he covered that gold with some dust so ranka saw from a distance and told her husband what are you hiding then he saw some gold my goodness i would not touch it even why you are trying to cover it like thought that you may be tempted and get it so for the reason i was covering 
but I am very happy that you are my right wife, that you have also very good renunciation. Anyhow, then what happened? That day they didn't get any fire within the forest. Then this couple are talking, well, perhaps we saw that gold, that was responsible for us not to see, get any wood. When they came home, they found a big bundle of wood in front of their door. My goodness, who brought it? It must be God brought this wood for us. Then Krishna appeared before them and told them that, don't worry, I shall look after you. And Namadeva was so pleased that because of their renunciation and purity and love, they saw God and God blessed them with all their needs. That is a beautiful story in India. I, last yesterday I was reading that how these people achieved everything through renunciation. If you really want to know something from, a, from the monks, you must be humble. As Sri Ramakrishna said, a top of the hill does not accumulate water. Water comes to the valley. You must be humble. Krishna mentioned, tatviddi pruni pate na puri prasne na sevaya. Tatviddi, know God, know the Brahman. Pranipat, by humility, salutation. Puriprasno, ask if you have any questions. And Sheva, through service. If you serve these holy people, they will come and try to communicate and try to give you something, some spiritual treasures. Perhaps you know that famous Zen story. A philosopher came to learn Zen Buddhism from a Zen master. The Zen master invited the professor for, a, for, for tea, and he was pouring tea in his cup. The cup was overflowing and falling on the floor. The professor said, what are you doing? The philosopher said, it is already full. Why are you pouring more tea in the full cup? The master said, that is the answer for you. Your mind is full of ideas, thoughts. There is no room for me to put any new teaching there. So you must empty your heart. You must be humble before you learn anything from these great people. Now I shall tell you my interviews and my reminiscences of these great Swamis. <clears throat> this book, this teach reminiscences will come in two volumes. Prachin Shadudir Kata, Stories of the Old Box. First volume has come out with 41 reminiscences. And second volume will come, I think, 79 or 78, 79 reminiscences. It will be a huge book, anyhow. First, I shall talk to you about Swami Vishuddhananda. He was a great Swami, a disciple of Holy Mother. He came to the Ramakrishna order in 1904 and got initiation from Holy Mother. And when I saw him, he was a vice president of the Ramakrishna order. I never saw him giving a public lecture, but every afternoon he would come and sit in the living room, and many devotees would come, and he would talk only about Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Swamiji. Upanishad, Gita, just satsang. He would create such an atmosphere, unbelievable. When you will be really hypnotized. Your mind will leave this world and you will go in a higher realm. 
that I saw. Perhaps you remember I gave a series of talk I think last couple of years, James from the Guardian of Saints, based on his conversation. These monks do not write books or do not go public for public lectures, but they are the oasis of spirituality. Whenever we get tired, exhausted, broke, bored, we go to them, and they inspire us. They remind us what is the goal. Really, they have the power to uplift our minds from the mundane plane to the spiritual plane. He used to tell us, first Ramakrishna, then his mission, not first mission and then Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna says, Age Ishwar, Pade Jagod, first God, then the world. If you just reverse it, you will be deluded by Maya. First world and then God, they will be confused. Maya is very confusing. Christ also says, first seek the kingdom of heaven and everything shall be added unto you. I remember when he passed away, 1962, sometimes in May, April, May, I was sent to the newspaper offices to print his obituaries. I still remember. Next, Swami Jyoti Sharananda. He was also a great Swami, a disciple of Swami Brahmananda. He came to Germany in 1930s and gave and opened a center in Wiesbaden. Then the Second World War started. He left Germany, came to America, and started a center in Philadelphia. There he worked for a few years. Then he returned to India in, in late 1940s, and he was in Bangalore. And he inspired many, many people, many men and women, young boys and girls. They joined the Ramakrishna order. When I was in the training center in 1964-65, I used to live in upstairs and he was downstairs. But we only saw a light in his room till midnight. Because his guru, Swami Brahmananda, told him, Mahanisha job kurve. Tale shanti pabe. If you really want peace, repeat mantra in the midnight. So his guru initiated him at that time, gave this advice, and that he followed. During his old age, he was always light in his room till midnight. They are nishtha. Their steadfast devotion is really remarkable. One, there are so many books about him, and he wrote also many books, Adventures in the Spiritual Life, Meditation and the Spiritual Life. His books are very, very important and practical. I remember once there was a in India, when there was a feast, the monks chant various hymns and they make a big noise. So in the dining hall, our monks are repeating the shlokas, and Swami was major remark, look, monks are so happy. Do you know why? Because they will get good food today. Anna Brahmakina, Annam Brahmaiti Bajanat, this Anna, food is Brahman. So these monks are, are getting Brahm, joy from Brahman. <laughs> Wonderful remark. I remember it was in 1963, 63 or early January 64. There was a big function in India, Swamiji's centenary in Park Circus. 
our center was very close, within a mile. So many monks would just stay with us. So Swami Jyoti Sharanandaji came one morning because he's supposed to preside in the women's conference in the afternoon. So he took lunch with us and he took rest and then he went to the meeting. So I still remember I made a soup for him. Carrying cut potato, beet, carrot, beans, various kinds of mixed vegetables. I made a good soup, and he was very happy. At least you know, I got a chance to serve a great monk even for a day. When we read his books, we find the depth of his spirituality and his personal experience, and. He also created a tremendous atmosphere. Even if you go to Bangalore and ask people, they will talk about him, that what an atmosphere he created. You know, if you are not deeply spiritual, you cannot create a spiritual atmosphere. That we see in these great monks. They are not talkers. They experienced. Then Swami Ranganathanandaji, I met him many, many times. First I met him in 1960, I first joined. And he was going to Japan to give me a series of lectures. And his book, Eternal Values for the Changing Society, just came out. At that time it was a small book. He was in charge of the Ramakrishna Mission Delhi. Then he was transferred to Calcutta in the Institute of Culture. And unbelievable. He used to lecture there. The Vivekananda Hall, I think its capacity was 1,000, full. They had to give three, 400 chairs outside in the balcony. I still remember his first lecture, Our Spiritual Heritage. I translated it into Bengali. And it was published in our magazine. Maharaj was very fond of me. He traveled all over the world. I think Indira Gandhi made him the Indian spiritual ambassador. And he talked about India's religion, philosophy, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda. And those lectures were published later in big, big volumes on eternal values in the changing society. He had fantastic memory. He was very well-read. And he had tremendous enthusiasm and self-effort, which are vital in spiritual life. Sometimes the little things we get broken, you know, we get depressed. That we never saw in him. No depression. Tremendous enthusiasm. Try. There is nothing wrong to fail. First try. He used to inspire us. He said, do you see all these monks? Everybody is contributing something to the order. Some people worship with five items. Some people worship with ten items. Some people worship with 16 items. Everybody is doing something, giving something to the order. That is the reason our organization looks great. We have many, many fantastic monks in our order. Learned, highly spiritual. I remember he, he, was, he was living with us for a few days, he was answering the letter of Sir Julian Huxley. He made a comment about Swami Ranganathanandaji's book, and he was answering. My goodness, I could not believe. You know, he is a monk, he, but he read modern science so thoroughly that he could speak like with, like, with authority. He is an amazing person. He was a very, very famous monk in the Ramakrishna order. And every year, he used to go to Dehradun to give lectures. 
to those people who will be the administrative jobs of the whole of India, the college IAS, IAS Indian Administrative Service. Swami Ranganathan used to give lectures to those people, students, and those who will be the high-ranking officers in Indian governments. Then Swami Atmosthananda Ji. I think I first met him, I think I'm Javanese, that I met him in 1960. He was then the head of the Ramakrishna Mission Hospital, Rangoon. That Swami was, he came, I remember, a Burmese Airways, and he got in Calcutta Airport, I went to receive him. And he stayed with us in Calcutta, because he has so many known people, always there will be a card in front of us so that he can do his work. Then what happened? In 1963, Nguyen, the governor, the military general, took over the Burmese government. He was a communist leader. And he asked all missionaries should be out from Burma. All Christian missionaries and all the Ramakrishna mission, all should be out. So all monks came from Burma and Swami Atmasthananda became the head of the Rajkot Center and built a huge temple there. He was very, he's a doer. And he, where he, whatever he do, he do the, he did the best, spectacular. There are so many memories coming to my mind. He did large heart. Whenever anybody is in trouble, if you ask help from him, he will help. Old monks are neglected. They do not have any good place to have rest and food and medicine. He built a huge Aragya Bhavan for the senior, old, retired, Sikh monks. So these monks gave their lives all through their lives. And now they are old. Nobody is there to look after them. So he built a huge place. Now all monks are taken care of. There are three places in India where our old monks can live. Belurmat, in the south, Alsur, and in Banaras. All old monks can go and just stay there and pass their retired lives. His contribution is immense. Then he asked me one day that you will have to give some money. I went to visit India. He said, we want to build a huge guest house in Kamarpukur, Sri Ramakrishna's birthplace, where people come from all over the world. We want to build for these foreigners and other people, those who come to visit our monastery. So we gave some money, I still remember. Maharaj was very fond of me. He came to America in our center here in 1998, in June. And just stayed two, three days. He went to Kansas City also. <coughs> then when he was in Kansas City, it was 19th June, 1998, Friday evening. Our devotees asked him, Maharaj, you made three direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. Vigyananda, Akhanjananda, Abhedananda. Please tell us about your reminiscences. Then Swami recounted his reminiscences. I, I, I generally, I got up, I got these reminiscences, we recorded in English, I translated it for my book. But I made Swami Vigyananda, in Belun March. At that time, he was the president of the order. He was a man of silence, 
spoke very few words. And not social at all. Always try to hide behind. He initiated very few people in the beginning. Then he came to see Swami Shivananda when he was dying in 1934. And he saw this great disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, even a deathbed initiating people, out of compassion and love for the people. So he felt that compassion for the people of Shivananda entered inside him. And then he began to initiate many people. The Swami said he was then a graduate student in Calcutta University. He was staying in Ramakrishna Mission, Calcutta student's home. And the head Swami, Nirvedananda, asked him, and another two, three boys, Swami Vigyananda has come to Belun Mat. You boys go and see him and ask initiation from him. So they went. He, they saw a Swami, it was winter time, covered with many clothes and coat and <coughs> cap and muffler and several socks sat there with closed eyes and did not talk. So these boys, young college students, they bowed down to Swami. He did not look at them. He did not talk to them. So they came to the students' home and reported to Swami, Nirvedananda. He kept quiet. And that night, Swami, Swami Atmasananda had a dream. He saw Swami Shivananda and then he saw that Shivananda was transformed into Swami Vigyananda. So he was massaging his feet and his feet. Then his very strange dream. Then next morning he told Swami Nirvedananda, Maharaj, I had this dream. You boys again go to the, to Belunmat and bow down to him and ask for initiation. So all these three boys, four boys went. Today, that day, Swami Vigyananda said, come, come, welcome, welcome. He received them and very happy to meet them and talk to them. Previously, he was very upset that, you know, even Swami Vivekananda's monastic brother, disciple, did not talk to us. But today he talked and he said, Maharaj, we, we love to have initiation from you. Come tomorrow. He gave instruction what to do. So next day, all these boys went and Maharaj initiated them. <laughs> it is a very, very interesting story. Maharaj taught us how to practice mantra, how to meditate. And he created such a wonderful spiritual atmosphere that which I cannot describe, Swami said. Then Swami Atmastananda asked him, Maharaj, we made so many mistakes in our lives previously. What will happen now? Don't do those things again. Your old past deeds will be obliterated, will be wiped out. If you say, I shall not do it anymore, your old past things will be wiped out. Then he said, give us some kind of <coughs> spiritual instructions. Then Swami said, do not tell lies. Don't be jealous. And never hate anybody. These are the three teachings he gave to them. Do not lie. Don't be jealous. And don't hate anybody. <coughs> then Swami said, I saw Maharaj a few more times. Then he passed away. I think in 1938 in, in Allahabad. Then he said, I saw Swami Akhanjananda, but I was then a little boy. I do not have good memory. 
he used to come to see a devotee of Holy Mother in front of our home in Murshidabad. That man had Parkinson's disease. And Swami Akhanjananda was the in charge of the Shargachi ashrama, very close. And he used to come to see him. I saw him from a distance, that much I can tell you. But I have no memory. <coughs> then he said that I went to see Swami Abhedananda in Vedanta Mot, but I shall tell you a very fascinating story about him. I went with another two, three devotees. Then Swami said, do you see that glass case? Inside that glass case, do you see a casket? That casket is full of gold. I collect it. When I started this ashrama, in the shrine, I had a desire to build a golden throne for Sri Ramakrishna. So one day I was taking that casket and going to a jeweler. So when he was coming down over the steps, I heard a voice. Hey, where are you going? What are you doing? I looked around. I did not see anybody, but I heard the voice. I thought it was just freak of my mind, you know, which is just hallucinating. Then again I went down, again I heard the voice. <coughs> you did not listen to me? What do you want to do? Don't go. I stopped for a while, a few times, but I was determined that I want to make a gold throne for Sri Ramakrishna. <coughs> Then again I started to move. I heard again a very strong voice. You don't understand me? Don't you remember that I could not touch any metal? And you now want me to put on the golden throne? Immediately I understood it was the master's voice. I took the casket, brought, <coughs> came back to my room and put the casket in the glass case again. Then I wrote to Mysore and asked them to make a beautiful throne with sandalwood. You see, Mysore is very famous for sandalwood. And then that throne came, look, that parcel is there. He opened and showed that sandalwood throne for Sri Ramakrishna. And that throne is still in Vedanta Mahaj. This is a story he told us. Then he told the story of Swami Shami Virajananda. After Swami Vigyanananda, Swami Shuddhananda became the president, then he died, then Virajananda became president. I think it was in 1939 or 40, and he died in 1950, What happened, he joined as a brahmachari, and he became the attendant of Swami Vigyanananda, seven and a half years. Some began, some Virajananda. Virajananda was a disciple, monastic, initiated disciple of Holy Mother, but monastic disciple of Swami Vivekananda. He said, he said about Swamiji's eyes, Ayoto Chakshu, Jal Jal Kotse, long, big eyes, and it is dazzling, dazzling eyes. When Swamiji went to Mayabhati in 1901, Swami Virajananda was in Mayabhati, he came to Kadgudam and to receive Swamiji. It was in winter time. In the Himalayan range, many places, snow. So he came with Danji, some kind of palanquin, walking 65 miles in two days so that he can receive Swamiji over the snow, walking. 
65 miles. Some Swamiji was very happy. Then he came to Mayavati and Swami, Swami Virajananda was cooking for Swamiji. I still remember one man who was in Mayavati at that time told, we did not winter time in that Himalayan region. There is, no much, there is not much vegetables. But I went to a village and brought some banana flower and some other banana stalk so that they can make some vegetables out of them. Anyhow. <coughs> Swami Virajananda practiced 17, 18 hours a day spiritual disciplines, but it is unthinkable for us. Mother's disciple, you will remember. Then he retired from Mayabhuti, I think, 1914. And just started a new center in Shamlatal, 30 miles away from Mayabhuti. It is also in the Himalayan region. And he, on the, still it is our beautiful center, on the top of the hill, he made the house with the local people, made the road from the main road, maybe a couple of miles. It's a beautiful ashram. One day he was trying to lift a big piece of stone, rock, and hurt. He was very sick, no doctor, lay down, took some rest. Then by the grace of Sri Ramakrishna, his life was saved. Swami reminisced about Virajananda. You know, we learned scripture and about his spiritual life from him, no doubt. But truly speaking, he was a great yogi. Whatever he did, he did with 100% mind. When he eats, at that time, if you wanted to talk to him, he said, look, I, have no, I do not have two minds, one mind. With that one mind, now I am eating. Don't talk. Whatever he does, 100% focus. He was a great yogi. I was his attendant for seven and a half years. And his work is very orderly. He was a great cook. He was a great gardener. <coughs> Office work, maintain, managing the ashrama, meditation, japam. Everything he did with 100% mind and very artistic way. But if you go to his kitchen, you will see spices, groceries, everything is just like a picture. And he knows, sitting in his room, he can tell this is spices in that place, they are here, he can tell you. But an amazing person. Precision and orderliness. You see, do you know what does it mean? If your external is orderly, that means your inside is also orderly. Your outside is haphazard, your work will show that what kind of mind you are, you have. That we must him. He's an amazing person. <coughs> well, he first came to Baranagar Mart, I think, in the 1890s. Well, we saw that his notebook, whatever songs and hymns are sung in the Baranagar Mart, that is the first monastery, he recorded in his diary. And his handwriting is so perfect as if it is a printed matter came from the press. Then he said that in Shamlatal, in his bedroom, there is a big, um, we call it Almira, which is a wooden case, you know, it is called that. Anyhow, there he will find his clothes and everything is there. He can tell you what thing is there. Everything he knows. Then when he would initiate, he would give some instructions. And at that time, he was very 
uplifted when you initiate. And <clears throat> Swami Shraddhananda told me, I used to record what he said. And those things came in a book form, Paramartha Prasanga, Toward the Gold Supreme. We sell that book. It is a beautiful book. Those who want to practice the spiritual disciplines, that book will definitely help. So <clears throat> he said, you know, when I initiate devotees, give me beautiful clothes. Use this cloth for binding my books. Next thing about his characteristic, sweet voice. Very slow, but and a gentle, sweet voice. But when he is upset, seeing our wrong action, we saw his long beard, his eyes are moving, eyes rotate. That means I know that he is upset. Then he used to be mad at us and correct us. He was a great taskmaster. Swami Shraddhananda of Sacramento was his secretary, and Swami Atmasananda was his private secretary. Then in Shamlatal, after we used to get up at 6 o'clock, meditate, have breakfast, and then we used to start our work. Swami would be late because he would meditate nearly 9 o'clock. Then he would take breakfast, then he will start gardening. Then he will come near my window and say, hey, come, do some gardening with me. But he would take, uh, we could not say no, so we had to do gardening with him. He wanted the ashrama should be neat, clean, just like a hermitage of ancient days. Even if you go to Shamlata now, you can see picturesque. Ramakrishna's place must be neat, clean, very artistic. Not haphazard and dirty. He mentioned, I shall never forget my golden days, that beautiful days with these great swamis. Then, <clears throat> Swami Gauri Sharananda, from 1897 to 1986. I met him first in Advaita Ashrama, most probably in 1962. At that time, he was the head of the Ramakrishna Mission in Lucknow. He was a disciple of Holy Mother. I have never seen such a simple person in my life. So simple. Just like a child, his action and behavior. <laughs> he was a very, he came to Holy Mother when he was a little boy in a school. And Mother was very fond of him. And he noticed that Mother had traveled to get flowers to, for worship in Nujarambati. He made a flower garden. He used to, <coughs> flower garden, vegetable garden, he told us the story that one column he made, there are two lemon, and he brought the thing, Mother, this would be a tree. My goodness, tree has not yet come, you came with fruits. And he, he used to tell us many stories about the mother. When it, in Jairambati, when the visitors come, mother had to make roll the chapati. So mother was making one chapati, I used to make three. Flat, then put another, then roll, flat, roll, another flat. Then he used to roll, then three chapatis will come at a time. Well, I learned from a woman that how to make three chapatis. Mother make one, I make three. <laughs> then that famous story he told us many times that mother's niece, Nolini, was baking these chapatis. And she complained, aunt, your chapati is not puffing up. Rama's chapati is puffing up. Mother said, I am an old lady. I am making chapatis all through my life. Ramla, Rama is a little boy the other day. You think he can be make better than me? I shall not do anymore. <laughs> then Rama Maharaj, the Gauri Sharan, he said, Mother, if you do not make chapati, I shall not make cha roll chapati either. Then anyhow, both they started to do again. Mother was very fond of him. Every Saturday after school, he used to come, stay Saturday, Sunday, Monday morning, 
Again, he used to go to school from mother's house. He was expert in roses, rose. He became the president of the rose competition in India. So he was called Rose Swami. So in 1977, when I went, I asked Maharaj, people call you Rose Swami, I like to see your rose garden. Come with me. He took me to Rose Garden and he said, you have come in summer, how can I show you roses? You should come in winter. Then I can see you all my roses. <coughs> then he told me, you know, I am more powerful than Sri Ramakrishna. Uncle, how? Sri Ramakrishna told, showed Mathur in one stream of flower, one red hibiscus, one white hibiscus. Two colors he showed in one stem. But I can show four colors in one tree through grafting. Rose, one red, one pink, one yellow, one white, one plant, four colors I can show. So I'm more powerful than Ramakrishna. <laughs> Who if you laugh? <laughs> Maharaj was so funny. <laughs> See, Ramakrishna rightly says, a person becomes simple because that person practiced austerity in previous life. Always remember. Janma janmantare tapusya thakle manu sarol hai. That is the exact words of Sri Ramakrishna. A man becomes simple, unostentatious, because of the previous life's tapusya. But now simple people are considered foolish, and those who are crooked, they seem to be <laughs> intelligent. After lunch, he used to chew some beetle roll. Mother said, when Ramla <coughs> chews beetle roll, his lips look very red, and I like to see it. So he, one day he made a remark in Belurmat, I remember. Hey, today Sri Ramakrishna's tongue is burnt. They put too much lime in, the, in that pan, in that beetle leaf. It is, Sri Ramakrishna's tongue is burned. I remember I had very acidic stomach. Mara said, after lunch and dinner, don't drink water. Drink water after one and a half or two hours. He gave the reason that how gastric juice works in the, human, in the, in the, in the stomach. He wrote me a letter on 10th September 1978. He mentioned that how some robbers came to Jairambati and how he ran away from them and then he wanted to retire and he took retirement and then passed away later. Very simple shadu. We met, I met another Swami named Yogi Sharananda. He was originally from Dhaka, Bangladesh. He saw Swamiji lecturing in Dhaka in 1901. At that time, he was a little boy. So he remembered. And Swami, then he became a monk, and Swamiji also mentioned that all monks should know Sanskrit. So till old age, he used to read Sanskrit grammar from our Punjit, our Sanskrit teacher. I remember seeing the rising sun, he used to pray. Java kusum shankasham kasya peyang mahadudim dantwaring sarva papagram punata usmidi vakaram. This is the salutation mantra to the sun god. Morning and evening, he used to pray to the sun god. And when there was a feast, we monks we used to chant various hymns. So he used to chant. And we used to say, hmm, hmm. We had to feed, feed, feedback. <laughs> so I still remember one day I said, Maharaj, will you not tell something today's Buddha's birthday? Will you not chant something about Buddha? No. Why? Because Buddha did not accept our Vedas. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> I 
I still remember one day, I was mm, most probably in 19, early 60s. I was in the line. We are going to bow down to the President Swami, Shankarananda. So, Swami Yogisharananda was in front of me. I am just behind him. So when Yogisharananda ji bowed down to Swami, or President Swami, Shankarananda said, Upuda, his name Upu. I am your servant. Who knows, Maharaj, I, you are not my servant. I am your servant. I am your servant. I am your servant. No, I am your servant. Then I saw these two monks, who is his servant, that they are talking, you know. It is amazing. It is how beautiful this kind of relationship. Mutual love, mutual respect. That we learned from these great monks, I tell you frankly. Then I saw another Swami, Hitananda. He was the head priest. He lived in the monk quarters. And on Sundays, generally our publication department was closed in Calcutta. So we used to go to Belurmach in the morning. And after Vesper, we returned to Calcutta, our ashrama. At that time, I used to go to every monk's room bow down to them, listen to their stories. They're all disciples of Brahmananda, Vivekananda, Shivananda, Holy Mother. So I used to hear from them all the stories. So <clears throat> that Swami also clean his books, his bed, his clothes, his floor, baranda, everything is neat and clean. He used to study the scriptures. And when he used to go to the temple to, to worship Sri Ramakrishna, it is worth seeing. As if he is worshiping a living person. After the Vesper, he used to take a soft towel, a little moisture, and he used to clean Sri Ramakrishna's eyes, Sri Ramakrishna's head, Sri Ramakrishna's face. It is, when you would see it, you can feel it. During summer, Vespa service, we wave the fan. Summer, he will go close and fan. In winter, he will stay away from the marble statue of Sri Ramakrishna. From a distance, he is fanning. This kind of feelings is very, very important. In summer, you need more air. Winter time, it is a ritual. So I am doing from a distance so that cold air may not touch your body. This type of things we learn seeing these monks, how to do it. He wrote a book, How to Worship. When I perform rituals, you will see in, in Durga Puja time, on 21st September, you will see, 21st October, you will see I am following his book. His book is followed all over the Ramakrishna order, How to Do Worship. Never lectured, but he led a life. Just life, that is enough. His life, this monk's life, is their message. Then I met another next Pujari Swami. He was this Swami, Swami Shulabhananda. He was his assistant. So when I went to Balloon March in 64, 65, two years I, used to, I, I lived there. So he said, Every day after breakfast, I shall give you a little work. You take a towel and dust the doors that they are tikuts, that Sri Ramakrishna's main temple, those doors. You dust you, so that there should not be dust in the temple doors. So that was my duty. Every morning I used to do that. Then during Durga Puja time and Sri Ramakrishna's birthday, two days we used to give bath to Sri Ramakrishna. It's a big job. Nearly it needs seven, eight, nine people. Four people only will soak water from the floor with towels because there is no drain from the main in the Garbha Mandira. And we used to pour water. I tip it, warm water, then put soap, 
then rub with the towel, then put again fresh water. Sri Ramakrishna would get full bath twice a day, twice a year. So we, that is the way and I used to pour water because I was a little tall and the statue quite, quite a high. It is more than life size, the statue in Belurba. So that was Swami and myself, we used to pour water and rubbing his body with soap and four, five people would soak water from the floor. I still, those things are very, very important to me. So many beautiful memories. And this monk was also very neat and clean. His worship also worth seeing. Then I saw another monk who was the helper in the shrine in Belur Monk. It's a huge affair. Every day, this Swami deep down on the Prabodh Maharaj. Now, as you know, not much education, just a few schools he went, he did not finish the school. He wrote to Swami Sivananda, I have no education, could I be a monk? You come, I shall make you a monk. Then Swami Sivananda said, go to the temple, pick flowers in the morning and, and bell leaves, make the sandal paste, cut fruits and serve Sri Ramakrishna. That is your work. That is, did, I think, 60 years. 60 years that Swami did that work. Nobody transferred him because his guru said. And the way he used to, at 3 o'clock, 3.30, he will come to the shrine. Then 4 o'clock, he will go. After Mangal Arati, he will go. <coughs> and pick flowers and bell leaves, then make sandal paste and cut fruits. I have never seen anybody how to cut, to how he, he cut fruits for Sri Ramakrishna. Sometimes you see, you call it tangerine, we call it orange. There's those segments, he would come with a knife, he will cut it in there, then he will open it. Then all the seeds are out, and he will put it and on a plate, he will arrange and all the white threads should come out. It is worth seeing that how he set the plate for Sri Ramakrishna. And then in the afternoon, he will make a garland for Sri Ramakrishna. This much yellow, this much red, this much blue, this much green. Green, there is no green flowers. So he will cut some leaves and make just the flower size and one stack green. In this way, he used to make the garland. During the Vesper, you can see that Sri Ramakrishna uh, around his neck, that garland is there. It is so worth seeing. It is an art how to make a garland. That is called real worship. We used to learn from him. Amazing person. I remember when I came in Hollywood in 1971, I sent one plastic raincoat. I saw with an umbrella he was picking flowers, so I sent a beautiful plastic raincoat so that in winter, rainy season he can go and pick flowers. And I sent two clippers so that he can cut roses and other flowers. Just nobody knows these swamis, but they led their life behind the, the main stream, you know. Then I met another swami, Yogatmananda. He was a disciple of Swami Sivananda. He used to look after the construction of our Radhaita Ashrama. He came in 1959. Yeah, in 59 he came from Banaras. His work was worship. He used to send me to many brick fields to buy bricks so that our ashrama could be built very quickly. And precise, the way he used to work, no waste. Nobody should cheat us. <laughs> you know, he's just an amazing person. One day he gave me a camera. He went to Koilash. And gave, I was with the photo department, so he gave me a camera. Then after, after two, three days, he took it back. 
Angela Maharaj, I did not ask you, gave me, why do you are you not taking back? Do you know why? Camera is a very expensive hobby. You are, you just joined the monastery, you are a monk. To fulfill your hobby, you will have to beg money from the devotees to buy films, to print those, develop those films. So you will start to beg money from the very beginning of your life. I don't want that. That is the reason I took it away. <laughs> Uncle Maharaj, I'm glad that you saved me. <laughs> he mentioned Aparigrahi is very important in the monastic life. Independence. Don't seek. Beg from me. There is a famous saying in Hindi, Magne se choto ha jata hai. If you beg, you will be small. Do not beg. I remember he was, was working for the Barashat Swami Shivananda Ashrama building. He was a building expert. Then I met another Swami, Dibbhat Pananda. He was expert cook. I have never seen a person can cook like him. No woman can cook like him. He cooked food for Swami Akhanjananda, Swami Bigyanananda. Whenever Bigyanananda would go, he would take him with him. He went to Rangoon, other places. Amazing for him. The way he used to cut vegetables, I cannot tell you. Seeing the size of vegetables, you know what kind of dish he is going to make. The size of the vegetable. If it is a hospice, or it will be a soup, or it will be a dalna, another curry, he knows everything, the size of the, and the combination of the vegetables. Amazing person. Even in old age, when he was retired, he used to go and cut vegetables for Sri Ramakrishna for a couple of hours. But do you know what? In late 1930s, he started to make pilgrimage all over India. He traveled so many places all over East, East India, West India, North India, South India, and wrote a book, Punna Tirtha Bharat. Punna, very virtuous Tirtha, holy Bharat. India is the land of the temples, holy places. He wrote a huge volume. It was published by Mitra and Ghosh. So in, during the second volume, he asked me, could you edit my book? And of course I can do that. So I edited his second volume. And amazing for me. Well, my time is over, so I shall stop now. Anyhow, some more are there, perhaps I shall in my next talk, in next time I shall talk about them. So I just told you about some Swamis whom I knew and I lived with them, their way of life, their dedication to Sri Ramakrishna and the, and the order. These, these things are not printed in the books. You'll have to learn seeing them. Reading a book, you cannot be a doctor. You'll have to go to medical school. That is the way it works. You will have to love these people and serve them. And you will be able to know many, many things about their life. Thank you. Um, sahana bhavatu, sahana bhunaktu, Saha viryam karvavahaye, tejasve navadhi tamastuma vidveshabahaye. Om shanti shanti shanti. May Brahman protect us, may he guide us, may he give us strength and right understanding. May love and harmony be with us all. Om peace, peace, peace be in